Hello and welcome to FS Derek. Um, we're in our favourite plane at the moment, the B200 King Air Carinado in X plane. And I've flown about 10 hours in this plane now and getting pretty comfortable with it. Found a few more things about it that uh, you might be interested to know. We're on the main apron, I think, at South End. I think it's the apron. I know we're definitely at South End anyway. And uh, I'm going to um, give you a quick guide of the uh, oxygen system. So um, in order to do that, we'll need to get up in the air. So let's get things, let's get this party started. So um, for convenience again, just going to remove the yoke. So what we're going to do is turn on the battery and then give it a few, uh, give it 10 seconds or so to go through the startup sequence and I'm going to try and do the engines in the correct order this time so we'll turn on the number two starter and then put that to uh, just the number two starter handle Have a quick look and see how much fuel we've got. About 700 pounds. That's fine. So we're looking at these gauges. And sounds like it's uh, continuously starting for some reason. I don't know why that is. Anyway, we're in the green. So let's just that's the Start on number one. And open up the throttle on number one. Put the generator on number two. That's got number one running. Let's wait until we get that in the green. Looking for about thirteen thousand six hundred. 1,360 RPMs on the prop, aren't we? Right, so by the time I've zoomed out, that will be ready. So we'll put the generator on. We'll turn the starter off. We'll turn on the beacon and strobe. We'll turn on the recognition, the navs, the taxi, That'll do for the time being. Now this, uh, we'll turn on the avionics and put the yoke back. There's one other um, thing I haven't turned on, which uh, I'm not going to mention at the moment, but it's relevant. And it was something that caused us a problem before. So let's just turn the master panel lights on and then dim the overhead floods and the instrument indirect lights. And that's got our panel set up. So we're not going to borrow the air traffic control this time because it has been a bit of a pain for us in the past. What I can do is just uh, clear the windscreen. Do, and then we can taxi out. So I'll do shift F, shift four rather, and go around. Now you'll notice that um, we don't have the chocks in, but the door's still open. So, press 7 on the keypad to get my favourite view. So, if you've got a master warning coming up and you can't work out why and everything looks alright on the panel, it's almost certainly because you've got the um, door hanging open. So, let's just shut the passenger door. Uh, if you hear me, so that's made it a bit quieter, isn't it? Right, lovely. So all the warnings have gone out now, we've got no warnings, no cautions. Let's have a look at the enunciator panel. We've got the ignitions are on, the bleed airs are off, and the landing and taxi lights on. So we've got a thing that's telling me that the gear's not down. So certainly that gear handle should be down, shouldn't it? Perhaps I put it up by mistake. Okay, so let's uh, take the um, handbrake off, assume that we've called for a radio check and 
Clearance to taxi. Now the persuasive. That's the way to the runway there. So off we go. Now we're taxing pretty well parallel to the runway, and I know at the south end it's um, 0, 06 and 24. So if we're taxiing about, um, let's have a look. We're taxiing about 100, aren't we? Uh, I reckon we'll be departing on 2-4. Nice gold effect isn't it on that uh, nose cone. It must be the setting sun. So I'm taxing on about uh, talk of about 130, 140. Now that's one way to get to the runway. I'm assuming this is another way to get to the runway. If you are, it doesn't. It, I haven't really found an overhead view that's usable. So I'll just have a quick look and see if there is one. View forwards with panel head-up display or nothing. No, that's. Just to just to let you see, that's forwards with nothing is just literally out of the front. Um, forwards with head-up display would be more useful for a fighter pilot, and uh, forwards with panel is obviously what you're going to want for the most part in a GA aircraft. Ride along, chase, circle. Still spot linear spark beacon tower runway weapon. So that's basically one, two, three, four, five, six. Not seven because it's a weapon. So let's try those. So we've got shift one, two, three is the runway, four, five. That's quite usable, isn't it? I wonder if we could... That doesn't go up and down though, unfortunately. Six. Eight. Yeah, shift four is the one I tend to use. Anyway, so no sort of um, satellite view as such, not by default anyway. Now we're going to need to decide where we're going to go, so we're taking it from South End, uh, from South End a good location to the west is um, Stapleford, which has got its co-located with the Lambourne VOR, so the um, code for that is LAM, so when I at the end of the runway we'll stop and put LAM in the flight plan. Now I'm assuming this line of yellow or orange dots across the runway is the entry point for the runway. Yeah, so it's got, you can see it's got like a solid line on our side and a broken line on the other side which is a sort of don't cross our way but Feel free to vacate the other way. Let's um, put the brakes on, get this up, have a look at the flight plan, get the cursor, clear that, and it's all gone. So now we want lamp on, don't we? So small, JKL, and then big once up to A, and again to A, and up to. M and then enter 
and then we want the one in the UK not the one in Italy enter now once we've gone to Lambourne we want to stay clear of the Heathrow we'll be north of Heathrow so let us set another one where can we go to uh, Bovingdon I think BNN then we'll call it a day with the navigation because that's all we'll need B and then all up to N and then doing this with the mouse wheel it's pretty difficult um, so that's the flight plan don't really need the cursor let's just show that so well, we seem to have some other stuff on the flight plan got Mike Hotel on the flight plan let's clear that off right now have a look at that that's better now we didn't we didn't put in Mike Charlie to Lambourne leg did we so let's um, put that in So let's do a small echo push up to golf and then up to Mike and then up to Charlie. Enter accept. Good. And we want to let's just check on which leg is active. Now the Lambourne leg isn't active, is it? The, the Echo Golf Mike Charlie leg is active so let's go down to the Lambourne leg click on the menu and activate the leg and let's just have a look yeah so when we take off we're going to be turning and flying about 280 and I'm going to want to um, climb about 3000 feet a minute and we'll climb up to about 15,000 feet and then I'll be able to show you what I want to show you okay so we're clear to take off. Release the brakes. Not going to do any engine run ups. We're going to do failures. I think we'll do failures on another another time, but let's not do too much. The weather, especially the stormy weather on X plane, is excellent. We'll have to have a stormy flight together at some point. That's when I've got about 40 hours on the type. Right. Everybody happy? Everybody strapped in? It's a long runway, so we're not going to uh, need a squawk. 4,700, not going to need flaps or anything like that. Let's just check everything's turned on. Yep, 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 yep. And then off we go. So, oh, I haven't put in the uh, Q and H. It's 2, 9, and 9 are 4. So let's dial that in. There we are. And we're off. Hold it on the brakes. It's somewhere in the ballpark on the torque. Let the brakes go. And now I can just uh, gently tweak the torque to about 2100. Once we're at about. See how the rain cleared there, so you picked up speed. That's very good. Now I want to be climbing at about 120 something. we are already. Let's have the gear up. Now we've got a positive rate of climb. And we want to steer it on the GPS. And so we'll engage the autopilot, tell it to fly navigation, which is basically GPS, and enter a climb and make that climb about 3,000 feet a minute. There we go. Now this ITT will drop off and apparently that's not right, apparently ITT should 
increase as you uh, climb and you so you should have to pull it back but in in this case of this plane people have been saying on the forums that it's modeled incorrectly and it's drop it drops and so you have to keep ramping it up the 3,000 feet climb you can see here means that we're climbing at about 120 feet a minute which is exactly what we want to be climbing at so let's just wave goodbye to South End that's the Thames there, Thames Estuary. And there's a car, look. A little, car, little random car light down there. See the the angle that we're climbing at? It's amazing, isn't it? In fact, we're, too, we're climbing too much because um, the speed's dropping so much. So let's just put it back to about 2100. And we should see that start to climb back up again. You can get to a situation where the plane is working really hard but it's just standing on its tail. So um, <coughs> it, it sort of gets into a, a state where it's flying very inefficiently. So um, what we need to do, it looks like it might be might be getting close to that. So let's just make sure it's, let's, let's just climb at 800 feet so we can get this airspeed up. And then once we've got the airspeed up, we can tell it to climb again at a reasonable rate. Say 2000. Now, we haven't told it where we wanted it to stop. Did I say 15,000 feet? And I'll show you something that's a, maybe a feature of the actual aircraft. But we, we've got it in a climb at the moment, but we haven't told it really when to stop. So. And we're about say 6,000 feet at the moment, so let's ramp this up. And you, as we go through 6,000 feet, watch the autopilot. Now, did you see that? It, it takes it out of the climb. So what we have to do now is put it back in the climb and tell it to carry on going up at 2,000 feet. So just be aware of that. If you get to um, if you get to the point where it keeps dropping out of the autopilot and you can't work out why, this is this is almost certainly the reason. We're going to be flying. We're going above um, three thousand feet, which is, believe it or not, is the what they call the transition level, uh, where we stop flying on the local altimeter pressure setting, the QFE, and start flying on the international standard pressure setting which is the Q&H so I'm just going to drop that down to 10.13 or 29.92 which is the 29.91 technically still 10.13 so we're now we're flying at flight levels so we're going through flight level 76 to flight level 77 and we're going to fly up to flight level 160 so everything's fine on here let's just check the navigation's going okay. That's fine. We're en route to Lambourne, aren't we? And uh, after that, en route to uh, Bombingdon. And then um, we could possibly come back to Clacton. So while things are a bit quiet, let's put that in now. Just go down here. And see. N. There used to be a way of um, entering these easily. Certainly, the Airbus and the Boeing 737s and things, when you if you're doing a lot of data entry, there was a way I think of holding out the Alt key and typing on the number pad. There may there may be something like that here. Let's have a look. Okay, so there we go. So Lambourne, Bobbingdon, back to Clacton. That's good. That'll keep us going around in circles for a while. The reason why the flight plan pages have their own key is because for precisely this reason they want you to be able to swap between the map and the flight plan quite easily and you can see we're already only um, nine miles away which at four miles a minute is um, is only a minute isn't it two minutes anyway let's put that away so landing lights we actually never got around to putting the landing lights on did we but we certainly don't need the taxi lights on so we can turn those off 
and we've got the starter motors off and everything so otherwise everything's fine so now would be a good time to do a quick feeder check so fuel is on and in both uh, tanks we've got a roughly equal amounts engines are in the green temperatures and pressures T's and P's fuel flow is still fairly high but then we're climbing now the torque you can see is dropped right off so I'm going to tweak it up to about 2100 again this plane will blow up if you if you over torque it um, but in fact that may be that may have been one of the reasons why the um, the speed dropped off I'm going to press 3 which I've got uh, I've got set up for this view and what you can do you can either press 7 to go back to where you were or if you press 3 you can press 3 again and it'll take you back to where you were so uh, now we've got a master warning coming on now okay here we go now you can see we've got an, an altitude warning here okay an altitude warning I was thinking it was an alternator warning or uh, God knows what else warning um, or it, it's basically it's telling you that you're the pre there's not enough pressure in the cockpit and in a second you're <laughs> we're going to start to black out so let's just dial this down a bit to 1500 because I think going up 1600 is probably a little bit too far can you see things are getting a bit dimmer yeah now the cause for this is this and I'll just move along a bit here and go down see if, let's see if we can do it before we black out you see these two dials here. The this is the um, pressurization, and whether the, if the plane is climbing, then we need to depressurize because we, you, you don't fight the depressurization as you go up. So let's for example, suppose you've got fifteen thousand feet, you depressurize the cabin to say eight thousand feet. Typically, most airliners depressurize to eight thousand feet. If the um, if you're descending, then the pressure's getting higher outside. Don't worry about it going blank. We'll we'll, um, we'll sort that out in a minute. Let me just go back. Let me sort it out. Now the way to get out of this is to go outside and then go back inside quickly, and you will then get the. So let's set that to twelve and a half thousand feet and put the autopilot on a descent and a fairly quick one as well and I'll just throttle back so I feel as I'm going to black out and I don't want to overspeed the engines on the on the descent so let's get back down to where there's more oxygen We're down to about 14,200 feet. Now, how far up is there oxygen? The easy way to remember it is it's oxygen up to about 10,000 feet. And for me, that 10,000 feet is about where I, I'm, I would need to start being in a pressurized cabin. Um, I mean, pilots that are used to flying in depressurized aircraft can fly 12,000, 13,000 feet without any pressurization. And you know, good luck to them if they want to take a chance of blacking out. Presumably they would they'd get some warning of that. But um, but anything over 10,000 feet, you're really going to need some sort of oxygen. So here we are, we're coming down to 13,000. Now you'll notice that the altitude, the, the LT altitude warning is still on. It's not an altimeter warning and it's not an alternator warning, it's the altitude warning. And we're just coming up on the um, descent, and you can see we're we're back again. We're back in the oxygen layer, so we're okay. So what was all that about? Right. Here are the dials I was I was searching around for for a while, and in particular these two. Now, this one is the whether or not the cabin's pressurizing or not and this one is the actual pressures so we're here it's telling us we're about 15,000 feet 
and the actual cabin altitude is there's no pressure at all so this is the reason why we run out of oxygen because we're not getting any pressure so so let's so how do we get pressure and the answer is these these two things here the bleed air valves now if I click those up let's have a look now and there's the other thing we need to do is um, tell it what uh, altitude we're going to be at and that's that's this thing here now it's a bit jumpy in that it sort of initially it starts off acting quite sensibly at the moment you can see you can see 15,000 feet really up to that point it's not all that bothered about pressurization but if we go up to say 17,000 feet or 19,000 feet or even further well, let's say let's say we're going to go up to 24,000 feet there we are what it's going to do it's going to depressurize the plane because it doesn't want to fight the drop outside so it drops inside but we've already said that we'd be okay at 5,000 we're in fact we're all the way up we're okay up all the way up to 10,000 which would only be about 34,000 feet then it would depressurize to 10,000 feet and we're hardly likely to go up to 35 so we can go on up to 24 at this point and it will depressurize to 5 so let's have another look at the this is my 6 view and see whether anything's happening let's just zoom in on that And now something's happening, isn't it? Can you see that? Can you see that's creeping up? And it's funny because this needle is down below, and yet this is creeping up, and that's because this is this is now pressurising. Let's get a look at that. Fids fit per minute. Well, who knows what that means? We'll find that out later. But anyway, if you find that this is this is going all over the place, and in fact you can you can increase the rate by I'm pulling back on the wheel, and you can see uh, paradoxically it's turning the rate up, and you can see that because the dial here is going up. So we're pressurising about perhaps it's a thousand thousands of feet per minute. So this will this will climb up to five. As soon as we go up to twenty four, it will go up to five. So let's re-establish ourselves in the climb and just prove that we're not going to black out. So we've got 24. We're not really um, didn't really put the engines back up to be after that descent. So we'll give the engines uh, their full 2100 RPM. 2100 torque. We'll go to the autopilot. We'll whack it in a climb. We'll call it a 2200 feet a minute climb. We can afford to be fairly aggressive on the climb because we're already doing 180 knots. So in fact, if anything, what I'll do is I'll trade off some of that forward speed for altitude by putting it in a 3,000 feet per minute climb, which you know it quite possibly can't maintain. And what it will do is it will maintain the pitch, the nose pitched up attitude, uh, but it will lose airspeed. And that's exactly what it's doing. And of course, we're going up like a rocket or like a homesick angel, as we say. See that um, reservoir down there with the pier in the middle of it? That's the King George V Reservoir by Heathrow. And I used to live right next to that. And, uh, and always um, used to see it as I flew past. And of course you can't... I couldn't fly over it and see my house because it's in the Heathrow control zone and nobody gets in there. Nobody gets in there. I'll tell you what I have set up and that's a, a key to look out the window as if I was a, a passenger and I've probably not chosen the best seat have I I probably um, I probably choose one should choose one um, a bit nearer a window you know I mean like a decent window have you seen these these are neat but 
Fancy a game of cards while we're waiting. Look at that, important people sit out there. Oh, it's very comfortable here. These lights are, um, not only can you turn them on, you can actually wiggle them around. And uh, they're very impressive after dark. In fact, what I might do is I might leave a couple of them on, uh, just in case we come back after dark. Look at that. Oh, okay. The pilot's... Um, just disengage the autopilot, or it's disengaged itself. Fair enough. So we're going to um, get some airspeed up by diving, and then we're going to have a quick inquest. Let's fly it back on the nav. Let's put it back on an 800 foot climb. see what that's done to the navigation. We may have, when you stall like that you can spin round. No, we're alright, we're actually um, turning aren't we because we're we're a bit Bovington and we should be on our way now to, um, let's have a look at flight plan, Clacton! Yes. There we are, so we're just turning round, we're on our way to Clacton. So that was a bit dumb. I was so busy showing you the, um, let's just put that away. There. I told you I was going to put the plane in an unsustainable climb, didn't I? And then immediately climbed into the back seat and watched it stall. What a wally. Let's give it um, now because we're sort of above 15,000 feet there. We're not going to get maximum torque anyway now. So we just put the torque up to maximum. And watch it climb up and we're okay now. So we probably could climb a bit faster than 800 feet but you know we're going to see a lovely sunset so that is the oxygen system and just to prove that I'm correct here we are we are at right around about 24 25,000 feet let me just zoom in on that because whenever I watch people do these videos. I'm always saying zoom them. You can zoom it in, zoom it in. There's the um, cabin pressurization, round about six and seven thousand feet. Depressurized, all right, don't forget. Depressurized to between six and seven thousand feet above sea level, and the actual altitude on the plane is around about um, twenty-five thousand feet. And here we can get a good idea of um, the maximum altitude of the plane, can't we? There we are, because we've got thirty thousand is when the green runs out. Good. So, back to fly. So, now by going with the angle brackets and various other, the um, rocker switch on the on the joystick. Here's the fuel. Now, let's see if we can get that actually a little bit better position. Come on, might as well look at it straight on. There we are. So there's the fuel panel. So um, we've got just over 700 pounds in each tank, which is plenty. So what what um, how what all what all these switches do? Right. Well, let's see if we can transfer some fuel, shall we? So first of all, let's. We've got a cross feed flow valve uh, switch there, and at the moment it's on off. So basically, there's no cross feed going on, which is right because you want this to 
you've got two engines, two fuel tanks, two fuel systems entirely separate. And that's so that if you don't get a leak anywhere in the system, it, the most it can do is leak half the fuel and you'll still have one fully serviceable engine. So let's assume that um, we want to move some fuel though from this tank to this tank. So logic would dictate, seeing as these arrows also point that way. We want to feed from this tank around the back of the engine through the cross feed and, and into this tank here. Yeah? And <clears throat> there's um so we should expect that to sort of start going up to eight and that to start going down to six. Now what is the implication of that? Apart from the fact that we're gonna have more fuel in one tank than the other. Both engines will take fuel from both tanks. So um it's not like we, we would we would have to run out of fuel on one engine and, and carry on flying on the other if the fuel got low. Uh, but it does mean that um, we, we would be heavy. So if we put, let's say we put a couple of hundred pounds of fuel in this tank and took a couple of hundred pounds of fuel out of that tank, there'd be 400 pounds in balance, wouldn't there, in the wings. So we'd have trouble flying level. So let's leave that for a bit and, and come back and see. Um, let's, I'll tell you what, let's just turn the standby pumps on as well. Here we've got the fuel quantity and, and it's showing us the, um, the quantity in the main tanks. And if you put that down there, you have to hold it down. It shows you the quantity in the auxiliary tanks, which is nothing, which is what we expect. And then down here, you've got two heavily guarded switches and if they are guarded like this then basically it means don't touch except in extremist emergency and they're the firewall shutoff valves so basically they literally isolate you from a fire and it looks like they they do operate automatically in the case of a fire because they've got a valve there haven't they so something must happen electrically um, but um, you've also got a chance to shut them off manually as well so but you shouldn't ever do it or you know or really shouldn't be the sort of switch that you should just flick while you're flicking the standby pump the cross free flow the fuel quantity and the fireball shut off valve to stop you doing that then they they put guards over the top of them you see any difference in these levels yet I can't this should be going down this should be going up anyway these things don't happen quickly, so no transfer. Hmm. Let's go back. Oh look, we've got little lily pad clouds there. So we're on our way to Clacton. So from Clacton let's go to Dover. And then from Dover we can go to uh Debt link. So flight plan down, up, 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 down, 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 D. Do that, go backwards to that, to V. And why not? I'll go up to that. It's quite quick with the mouse, DVR. Enter, and we want the one in the UK, not in. The intersection in Papua New Guinea. And once again, if it shows 5,600 miles here, then you know you've got it wrong. And last but not least, D. There, let's have a look. So there we are. Yeah, so Clacton, Dover, Deming. Good. Now, let's have a look at what else have we got here. Let's move along. I'm using the right cursor button and the joystick hat. And then the this is the move forward key, which is the on, on the which is the right angle bracket. You can use the zoom key. And it may do the same thing. 
that zoomed right out. Let's move in a bit. And let's zoom in a bit and zoom out. Yeah, no. Actually, well, I prefer to um, move in rather than zoom in. Although on a digital display like this, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, yeah, it's good. Um, coffee, please. There we go. Yeah, coffee. Please. There you go. So here we've got um, we've got traffic now. There is no traffic on, and you know I haven't got any traffic in there. But you've got two options: normal and display off. You've got a, some settings on the brightness, which is basically bright and not bright. We can center the aircraft in what's called a rose, or we can have the forward view, which is like a radar view, forward of the nose. Um, we can declutter the display because at the moment you can see it's got all these points on these triangles which are sort of um, waypoints and they are um, what's the best way to put it they're artificial they're just basically where two lines cross so if you draw a line from A to B and a line from C to D and they cross then you might have a triangle there just and it just denotes a particular point in two dimensions on the map and here we've got CLN 21 and CLN 20 so I would be willing to bet that that's 21 miles from Clacton and that's 20 miles from Clacton pretty well in line with the runway here we are there's Clacton 16 so there's five miles between Clacton 16 and 21 um, okay so that's and you can get rid of those because for the most part, unless you're looking for them, you don't need them. So we'll just turn them off. Now let's um, put the range up a bit. Let's just seems like about five miles is about as high as you can get. So we've got rid of all the waypoints, and let's see what happens when we declutter more. Something disappeared, didn't it? And I think it's probably all the minor airfields. So let's just let's get got rid of everything. Now, what's all this green stuff? You ask. Is it has something gone wrong with the display? No, it's it's actually weather. And there's not much in the way of weather at the moment. So there's all the waypoints. There, that's a little. That looks like a little airfield. I should, I'm willing to bet that's a little airfield. That's Herne Bay. Herne Bay is actually Maypole, which is near Herne Bay, so that's Echo Golf Hotel Bravo. This is Echo Golf Mike Hotel, which is Manston, which is actually closed now, but it's still in the database and, and you can land there for the purposes of the simulator. This actually is the North Foreland NDB. So in fact, um, that when you when you declutter the second time, what you're doing is removing the NDBs. Now, and we can prove that by um, putting the NDB in. So let's go to the flight plan and just move down. Uh, we to get ourselves in the right place first. So big arrow and then small arrow and it's MTN Manston so M T N Enter Accept So we've got collect now we're on Clecton Manston Dover So let's go back and see thought that was the North Fallen oh, I thought that would that would put us on the North Fallen beacon. Okay, let's go to um, our maps, which we would have in the plane, so don't you know start complaining that I'm cheating here. Let's go down here, North Forland. Okay. So MTN must be some sort of um, NDB on the Manson Aerodrome. 
what we want is NF. So let's go back up and small and big and then small f North Foreland enter UK accept right so that's North Foreland so now we can we're going to clear Manston now let's have a look ah, 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 ah. there we have the North Foreland beacon right excellent you're beginning to get the hang of this navigation are you we declutter it, but it's still, the, the, it doesn't change the flight plan, it's still there. We might as well have it on. There's no point having the waypoints on. As far as the base map goes, there's no terrain data in this plane, in this, in this instrument. You can get terrain data and if we go back to the local map you see we've got a choice here between having a, a high-speed view which is nothing but nav aids if you want to center on the aircraft you can click down here and just center on the aircraft here you know, and then and drag the map and you see here it's got all the waypoints on it you see we're just about to turn at Clacton and go down to North Forland but you can turn all the fixes they're called, fixes. You can turn all the fixes off. And there's a low on route which has got all the airway. So this is L890 airway. So let's say for example if we were going to from Stapleford to wherever L980 goes to, unfortunately it, it sort of it won't draw beyond a certain point. So I don't know how you might get the the French part of this. There's no really good route planners either that I found so far. There's the high on route, and you see we've got UL at 980, so that's upper upper um, level 980, as opposed to lower 980, and that would be for jets flying at sort of 35, 36,000 feet. And then you've got the sectional, which is basically the chart that most people would be more familiar with from driving which has basically got line features on it which in this case is mainly water and um, uh, railways and um, power lines so for example if you see here now you see here Lashington Headcorn you see that massive great long straight line there that's a railway so really if you want to find Lashenden, and you just you can see this railway from all over Kent. You just really got to work out whether you're this side of it or that side of it, and then just follow the railway, and then that takes you straight to Headcorn. So I tell you what, I want to. On the other one, the last one is a textured one, which has basically got the uh, sort of photo of realistic scenery overlaid on it, which I don't see the point of that really. Right, and we're back in the plane. So, isn't that lovely? You see, this is what I like. This is all included, all this lovely clouds. And that's really, that's not that's not all the clouds by any means at all. We've got a warning on here. Right, turn right to 194 in 11 seconds. It's going to be done automatically. We're going to have a, let's kind of have a quick look out the window. But around we go. There's the uh, North Foreland. That used to be an island in Roman times. There was a river that ran across here. And uh, even now, if, peop if people in general aviation aircraft are flying round that part of East Kent, they, they say they're going round the island. And the air traffic controllers know what they mean. It's the Isle of, Isle of Thanet, it's called. The Island of Thanet. The Isle of Thanet. And it was cut off by a river called the Wantsum. W-A-N-T-S-U-M in pretty much the way that um, Sheerness is now. You can see the Sheerness. Sheerness has got a massive great chimney on it, which is great. So this is my local, where I fly locally. And, um, you know, you can take off from anywhere in Kent. And if you're going west, uh, you just take off and you look for the, the chimney on, on Sheerness and you just go straight for it. Right. How are we diddling? We're not doing too bad, are we? We're going to want to land at some point, so I think what we ought to do is 
what I, what I haven't done is coursed off the prop so just to show you how to do it I'm going to pull it back and I don't really know how much to pull it back but I'll pull it back to I'm going to pull it back too much because it feathers itself but um, that, that's something that's a bit of a noob mistake I should have done that should we check on our fuel I'll tell you what we'll do let's put ourselves in a descent because we're going to want to land at some point and it's going to take us a while isn't it to land from 24,000 feet so let's go down to the autopilot put ourselves in a descent and we'll make it a 1200 feet a minute descent there we go and because we're in the descent we're going to want to cut back on the propeller so we don't overspeed and we'll find the prop there we go and cut back on the propeller a bit more on the on the power now you have to do that in a particular order because um, basically if you're going to change the angle of the propeller it's best to do it when it's spinning as slowly as possible but I don't mean you've literally got to like pull right back on the power just to change the you don't have to but basically there we knew we knew we were going to cut the power and we needed to find the prop so the best way to do it is to cut the power first and then find the prop don't find the prop while it's going full speed and then cut it back it just puts unnecessary wear on the prop uh, mechanism and you do it the other way around so supposing we wanted to um, Supposing we wanted to course or find the prop and increase the power, then you would course or find the prop first and then increase the power so that it was done at the lowest power setting. So let's check that it's doing what we want. So we're in we're in a nice descent here. We've done we've made the classic mistake, haven't we, of not dialing in the altitude we want to finish at. So let's say we want to finish at three thousand feet. We're gonna to have to get the autopilot up again because as soon as we bash through 22,000 it's going to have a fit oh no yeah yeah it's moved itself out, out of descent so let's put ourselves back in the 1200 descent there we go and we'll say we'll go down to 3000 I'm doing this with the mouse um, because it's it's slightly longer but you get far more control you can just hold the mouse button down and drag this up and down um, which is okay for one you don't run out of screen real estate and it also leaves you on some funny numbers like now I've got a 60 on the end of it so it's 30, 60 good so we're coming down at 180 knots our fuel flow is extremely low so we're using no fuel at all now so that makes up for the fact that we've used loads of fuel yeah, you see that you can't. Best thing to do is put it on a zero, and then do it with the mouse wheel. There we are. Accuracy, pays dividends. So this is the uh, North Foreland. Yeah, these. I find it hard to believe that these should be the small. This is Herne Bay. There's Maypole. There's um. Manston. This is North Foreland and this is uh, Dover DVR. Actually, one you see there's an LFAC there and LF. You may wonder why why these are EG and these are LF. The answer is that EG is all the airfields in the UK are EG. And all the airfields in France are LF. So EG, MD, Mike Delta, I think that's LID. Right. Where were we? So down to twenty thousand feet. Now we've got to decide where we're going to land. And it would be nice to land at somewhere with a ILS, wouldn't it? So we can. It's a nice view across the channel, isn't it? And it would be nice to come down some. Well, it's early in the morning actually. It's 7:40 in the morning, so the the light's only going to get better. So it doesn't really matter. But um, 
let's just show you how to use it. We'll just pick a totally random airfield and land there. Uh, so let's go here and get rid of the flight plan and go click right and right. And here's all the nearest airports. We get a cursor and we can go down and see what we've got going on. Now, Kilo Bravo, these are the French ones. Well, they're all 51 miles away. And they're all VFR. We want one with an ILS, don't we? So, did you see anyone with an ILS? Oh, there was one there. Echo Golf Uniform Whiskey. 50 miles away. Now, if we... Um, so if we drop, if we just take the first digit, which is 4, so say 4.8, say 5, multiply by 3 is 15. So we're a little bit high for that, but we can, we'll, we can, you know, stooge around a bit beforehand. So let's say we're going to land at Echo Golf Uniform Whiskey. I honestly don't even know where that is. So. Echo, I hope it's not on bulk, through the past. Echo, golf. Uniform. And then down to the view. Where is it? Watership. Okay. Washington's a military airfield, so we're going to get into trouble for landing there, unless we declare an emergency. So get a pencil and paper out and start thinking of reasons to declare an emergency while I have a quick slurp on my coffee. I'm going to go direct to Detling, so we can. I'm going to cut the Dover out. So what I'll do is just go down Detling menu, activate the leg, and it's as simple as that. Now we're on our route. We're on route to Detling. That's Dover and Folkestone down there. Channel Tunnel. Nice to fly over and watch the trains going into the Channel Tunnel. That's the Lid Peninsula. There was a flying school at uh, Manston, Ted Girdler, Aviation. Unfortunately, Ted died in a flight display, I think, at Eastbourne. And then they shut the Manston airfield down, so the TG Aviation, as it was then called, relocated to Lid. So they've got quite a, a nice long tarmac runway. And the reason why this part of England's got so many very nice, very long tarmac runways is because they were all built to accommodate the bombers that were um, coming back in the war. And quite a few of them were shot up and had half tail missing, half wing missing, a couple of engines missing, etc. And it was very, it was imperative that they got on the ground as soon as possible. And if you, if you um, just look at that bit of land, which is going to obligingly go into a bit of cloud now. You can see um, the lid airdrome there, and you can see it's on the first bit of ground that um, the bombers would have come across. And the reason why it's pointing in this direction is because um, most runways in the UK point southwest, northeast southwest. And the reason why that is is because the prevailing wind is from the southwest. And by prevailing, I mean most 
common, most likely, most often, most most frequently encountered. So we're going to um, keep the speed up because no reason not to. We're at 13,000 feet and we've got 22 miles to go to Detling and 51 to go to um, Watersham. So in fact I think we could probably go direct to Watersham now, couldn't we? So menu, enter, there we go. We take the first digit, five and a half, say six, multiply by three, 18,000, we're well below the uh, height that we need to be at. So we are now en route to Watersham. Actually, you can land at military airfields, um, you know, but we buy permission. They don't often give permission, but sometimes um, they do have fly-ins and they let local flying clubs and that fly in. And uh, presumably they hide everything first. And um, <coughs> the only problem is, normally to fly a plane you have to have about £5 million worth of third-party insurance. But the RAF insists that you have to, to fly into a... RAF station, they insist that you have £225 million pounds worth. So, uh, quite effectively keeping um, GA aircraft out. Which is not very friendly. So, on the one time that we'd, I did fly in to an RAF base, um, we had to take out special insurance for the day. It cost an arm and an egg. Mind you, it was good fun because I had a chance in a, uh, going to a Tornado GR1 simulator. So, that was a uh, that was um, something that you don't get to do every day. Well, something you only get to do once in a lifetime, really. Should we see how pressurisation is doing? There we are, we've got the plane. Zoom in. Plane's down to about 8,000 feet and the pressurisation is down to 5, so what we need to do is take this down don't we because we don't need it pressurized at five anymore so I'll take it right down to nothing there we are I'm still not entirely sure what that's doing I presume I mean, it's it presume it's pressurising the plane because we're at five thousand, and uh, let's have a look. Oh no, we're at ten thousand, and we're pressurised to five, so we're still a little bit over pressure compared to the rest of the area. But it's taking it down. Can you see that? See that needle's falling slowly. So it's taking us down to ground level by repressurizing the plane. So presumably down is pressurizing. Down is pressurizing. We have to remember that. How are we going to? You can remember that. I don't. I won't remember that. Now how are we doing with the fuel flow? Oh, oh! Look at that. We've shifted. We're we're down to five and a half there and seven and a half there. So we have shifted two hundred pounds of fuel. Now that's a bit interesting, isn't it? Let's just knock that on there, shall we? Turn the standby pumps off. Yeah, so it does work. Excellent. It hasn't doesn't seem to have made much difference to the handling of the plane, though. But it's possibly because the plane itself is. Um, is accounting for that. What you need to do is um, there's your there's your aileron trim left and right, and there's your rudder trim left and right. We might have put some in, might not, might have done. What you need to do is look at this ball. And if the ball is um, over to one side, then the plane's out of trim. So let's just show you. If we can show you. 
let's just dial in some outrageous rudder trim and let's see if we can go back and look at the ball. Can you see the ball? Way off to the side, isn't it? It's skidding over to the left, isn't it? What that tells me is that the plane is, is completely out of whack and you can see that the um, artificial horizon is not vertical, is it? So, let's dial that back. And it was left, wasn't it? Did you see that? Left, plus left. So we had it plus one to the left. And in fact the ball was over to the left, wasn't it? So supposing the ball was over to the left, what we would want to do is would be to put in some right, and then the ball would come back to the middle. That's worth remembering. The other thing about this ball is that if you get into a spin, an inadvertent spin or a you know a intentional spin, which you wouldn't do in a plane like this because it's uh, it's not certified for spinning. Um, this ball would save you because there are two ways you can spin, sort of clockwise and anti-clockwise, and it's not always easy to work out which which type of spin you're in. And the way to get out of a spin is to jam your foot hard on the rudder, either the left rudder or the right rudder, and the plane will slowly slow down and then eventually come out of the spin, leaving you in a death-defying <laughs> dive. So then, you then your next job after getting out of the spin is to get out of the dive. But assuming that your first thing to do is get out of the spin, isn't it? And what you do is you look at this ball, and if the ball is hard over to the right, it means you're supposed to, you you've got to jam your foot on the right rudder and if the ball is hard over to the left it means you're spinning the other way and you've got to jam your foot hard on the left rudder and the way to remember that is to think of it as a little football and what you're trying to do is kick it into the middle so if it was over here you'd kick it with your right foot if it was over here you'd kick it with your left foot so you kick it you literally kick it back into the middle there we are Oh, into stuff that you need to know, is there? Now, how are we doing? Well, we're not on the line, are we? To Watersham. So let's find out. Is that because we didn't activate it or something? Should have activated that leg, shouldn't we? What's the other possible thing? Perhaps we're not working on the nav. Yeah, we are on the nav. Can't trust these planes to do what you want, you know. I'm going to pull back on the old throttle a bit because we don't. I don't want to rush it now. We're 26 miles away. I need to choose a procedure, so I'm going to select approach. The um, ILS is the best one for us, so we we'll click enter, and we'll just say vectors, and we'll activate it. Why is that suspended? It looks like it's flying towards it, doesn't it? So it's going to this waypoint, WTZ09, which is 30 miles from Watersham. So it's Watersham and 09. So it might be on the it might be on the final approach, nine miles out on the final approach. Then the next waypoint is I, which must be the um, inner inner marker for Watersham, and that's also on 235, which is the heading of the runway. So basically, it's telling me that's the heading of the runway, and then runway 23. So no, I'm going to turn that off because I don't like that. I don't know why that's. I don't know why it's not navigating towards it. This is the great thing about these systems. Either they they appear not to be working, but it's almost always your own fault. Almost always. No, when that happens, just push clear. Let's go to let's activate that leg and see if it does anything. Come on, you should be flying northeast. Right, what do you do? What do you do? When the plane's not doing what you want, you turn it to fly.
fly the heading bug. Ah. And that forces it to. It forces it to do.